Welcome to you all to the Adelaide Biomed City Mini Review Webinar Series. My name is Andrew Zanatina and I'll be your chair this afternoon. Uh, before I introduce our first speaker, I'd like to acknowledge the Ghana people, the original custodians on the land in which we meet. I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. This afternoon, we're actually very pleased to introduce two speakers, Professor Michael Horowitz and Professor Gary Whittett. And our first speaker this afternoon is Professor Michael Horowitz. Uh, so Michael's a lead in the Centre of Research Excellence translating nutritional science to good health. He's also the professor in the School of Medicine at the University of Adelaide and the director of the Endocrine Metabolic Unit at the Royal Adelaide Hospital. Uh, Mike, Michael is a, a pioneer in research relating to the function of the gastrointestinal tract and its relevance to blood glucose control in diabetes. But because not surprisingly, no one else has been interested in this area, so Michael has made it his own. So uh, the uh, title of Michael's presentation is Gastric Emptying and Blood Glucose Control in Diabetes, The Chicken and the Egg Revisited. So uh, welcome, Michael. Thank you very much, Andrew. I've spent some 35 years conducting research relating to the relevance of gastric empty to diabetes. Many colleagues, including Gary Whitter, regard this as an ill-considered career choice. Furthermore, in the majority of cases, the outcomes have been exactly the opposite to what I had anticipated, which is, of course, why clinical research is both stimulating and useful. Diabetes can be type 1 when treatment with insulin is obligatory or type 2 when it's usually not. In both cases, normalising the elevated blood glucose levels markedly reduces the risk of the development of the so-called microvascular complications of diabetes, eye, kidney and nerve damage. One of these complications is abnormally slow stomach empty or gastroparesis. This slide shows markedly delayed gastric emptying of liquid barium in a type 1 patient with gastroparesis who had debilitating recurrent nausea and vomiting. But the use of liquid barium is a very insensitive method. So how should we measure gastric emptying the Holy Roman Emperor Frederick II ordered two men to be fed a large meal and then sent one hunting and ordered the other to rest to determine under which condition digestion is aided. Frederick had both men executed and disemboweled to discover that the stomach of the man who had rested was empty while that of the man who had been hunting was full and we're no longer allowed to do that sort of experiment. Centigraphy, the use of radioisotopically labelled meals and a gamma camera to quantify gastric empty was developed in the early 1980s and it still remains, somewhat surprisingly, the gold standard technique. When centigraphy was applied, gastroparesis was shown to be a common rather than a rare disorder. So the gastric emptying of solids or nutrient liquids is abnormally delayed in perhaps 30 to 40% of people who have long-standing poorly controlled diabetes. In contrast, in the situation of type two diabetes, which is well controlled, emptying, and here it's expressed as a kilocalorie per minute, in, unlike the previous slide, Emptying is usually normal or slightly more rapid than normal. It was expected that symptoms such as nausea and vomiting would be highly predictive of gastroparesis, but this was not the case. So in both type 1 diabetes and type 2 diabetes, the relationship statistically exists, but it's very weak. So I was wrong again. Gastroparesis was also thought to be so-called irreversible, but it is clearly affected by the glycemic environment. So the elevations in blood glucose, hyperglycemia, slow gastric emptying of solids and liquids substantially, whereas 
hypoglycemia induced by administration of insulin markedly accelerates gastric emptying in a dose-related manner. And this is almost certainly an important counter-regulatory mechanism. So now we come to the chicken or the egg. Because as well as being determined by the blood glucose, gastric emptying is a determinant of the rise in blood glucose levels after a meal. So we have healthy subjects on the left and type two patients on the right. And in both cases, if gastric emptying, and this is gastric emptying within the normal range in most cases, if that is more rapid than normal, the rise in blood glucose is greater. Furthermore, if we modulate the rate of gastric emptying pharmacologically, that strongly affects the postprandial glycemic response in type 2 diabetes. So if we look at the blue, we're slowing gastric emptying with morphine, solid slow, liquid slow, and that is associated with a marked reduction in blood glucose levels. If the antibiotic erythromycin accelerates gastric emptying of solids and liquids, and that increases the peak blood glucose response. So where have these insights taken us over 35 years? Unfortunately, diabetic gastroparesis associated with severe symptoms remains an important disorder. And there have been diverse therapeutic approaches and more and more approaches, but the outcomes are frequently suboptimal. And this is probably in large part because the long-standing premise that symptoms were the outcome of abnormally slow gastric emptying is simply incorrect. Now, what has happened in relation to blood glucose control is much more positive. And I'll provide one example. A hormone glucagon-like peptide 1 was known to stimulate insulin and reduced elevated blood glucose levels in type 2 diabetes. So it was a promising treatment for type 2 diabetes because it didn't have the risk of hypoglycemia. But the problem was that GLP-1 was degraded very rapidly with a plasma half-life of about two minutes. So there was a generalized search for a stable form of GLP-1. And this was first identified, at, would you believe, in the venom of the Gila monster lizards, which they have in the Adelaide Zoo. And this is exenatide, which has about a 50% homology with GLP-1. Exenatide was approved for the management of type 2 diabetes by the FDA in 2005, and it's still used extensively. And it does stimulate insulin to reduce blood glucose levels. But the major mechanism by which exenatide reduces blood glucose levels after a meal is by slowing gastric emptying. So to summarize, these is, this is what I have learned. Gastric emptying is delayed gastroparesis in 30 to 50% of patients with long-standing, poorly controlled type 1 or type 2 diabetes. The extent of the delay is often modest. Delay in gastric emptying is a marker of gastroduodenal motor abnormality, not the cause of symptoms. In well-controlled type 2 diabetes, which is frequently the case nowadays, gastric emptying is usually normal or slightly more rapid. And that, of course, may predispose to the development of type 2 diabetes. Gastric emptying is both determined by and a major determinant of postprandial glycemia. And that has led to its therapeutic modulation so that slowing of gastric emptying by GLP-1 receptor agonists, there are a number of drugs in this class, and I've shown just exenatide, reduces postprandial glycemic excursions 
and improves overall glycemic control in type 2 diabetes. If that is a bit difficult, this will be a, a summary. And my last slide, on the left, you have type 2 patients poorly controlled and obese. On the right, type 1 patients poorly controlled and thin. And they have just learned that gastric emptying is central to diabetes and probably, at least in my opinion, important to its personalised management. Thank you very much. Thanks ever so much, Michael. That was fascinating. And I, I think the, um, the thing that I took home from, from that presentation was, was simply um, to be having born in this era when Frederick wasn't around disemboweling his uh, test subjects. Um, so I'm glad that you've also not been able to receive ethics approval to do those types of studies as well. So he thank goodness. University. <laughs> Look, thank, thanks so much, Michael. Um, look, again, I would ask uh, uh, viewers of this podcast to, um, to uh, feel free to ask their questions through the Q&A, um, and uh, I can relate them to, to Michael. But I might make a start, if that's okay, Michael, and uh, just a couple of very quick questions from my perspective. Um, clearly, the, 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 from the presentation that you've provided, is the, the, the stomach is, and, and, the, and the duodenum play a critical role in, in, in type 2 uh, diabetes and management and control. Um, what do we know about the effects of sleeve gastro uh, gastrectomies uh, um, and in, in terms of people who have had a partial or a total removal of the, the stomach in terms of their glycemic control? Can you just sort of tell us a little bit about that? Well, sleeve gastrectomy is one of the major procedures for people who are massively overweight. It's very effective. It probably doesn't have major effects on gastric emptying. A large percentage of the stomach is bypassed. The other major procedure is so-called Rouen Y gastric bypass. And in that situation, there's a small remnant of the stomach, but probably a major mechanism for its beneficial effect is changing the release of glucagon like peptide one by stimulating its release from the small intestine. So the whole pathophysiology, I mean, Gary knows more about this area than I do, in fact, of bariatric surgery and how it improves glycemic control is still very poorly defined. Uh, thank you, Michael. I, I just had a, a comment or a question, uh, actually, back to the question from Gary. It says, if gastric emptying is slow in people in poorly controlled diabetes, which is there a recent obsession with the use of Nova Rapid Insulin? Hopefully you can explain a little bit for me because I don't know what that is. That's the first time Gary has shown any interest in my work. And I'm <laughs> grateful for that. But Gary, I mean, Gary's actually been a supporter of this work and we get on very well. Uh, but it's true that gastric emptying, when it's delayed, intuitively will make it hard to match the absorption of nutrients with the absorption of insulin. So, uh, uh, so if you have delayed gastric emptying, it's a cause of low blood sugars immediately after a meal. And my last slide was inferring that from a number of aspects, routine measurement of gastric emptying may be relevant to therapeutic decisions of people with type 1 and type 2 diabetes. And uh, hopefully I may end my career with that actually being the case. And Gary's led a situation where measurement of gastric emptying may facilitate optimal insulin delivery. Excellent. Look, thank you for that. And thanks for the question, Gary. I have just one other question. It's relating to the, the sort of uh, the GLP-1 uh, uh, analogues. Um, you mentioned that the one that's moved into the clinic, and there are several I'm aware of, the, but the, um, the Gila Monster derived um, uh, GLP-1 has about 50% homology with the human GLP-1. Is that, is that that's, my... That's correct. correct. Yeah. It's a, so that it, the... That has a longer half-life, I'd imagine, than the human GLP-1. And so, so that is administered twice a day, exenatide. Right. Right. But now the majority of GLP-1s are given as weekly subcutaneous injections. Right. And has there been much work in terms of understanding what um, it, it sort of changes that can be done to the polypeptide sequence to provide the degree of stability but yet functionality? There's a huge amount of work in that area, trying to get prolonged half-lives of the drug. That's occurring in another development. Again, this overlaps into Gary's research interest, 
is combining GLP-1 with other peptides, particularly glucagon or GIP for greater efficacy. So this merges not just into diabetes, but particularly into weight management and obesity. Thank you. And one final question, if I could, before we move on to our second speaker. It is, um, it's from uh, Alexia Pena Vargas. Uh, she's asked the question, oh, can, can you comment on oral GLP-1 agonists? There, there's one in development, semaglutide, which is licensed now in the US and is actually absorbed from the stomach. So its efficacy is impressive. All of the GLP-1 class associated with gastrointestinal adverse effects. Uh, I'm, I haven't seen the, sort of the core data. We, have, we think almost certainly will have a substantial effect to slow gastric emptying, but Novo Nodus doesn't agree with us. Okay, thank you, Michael. Look, thanks ever so much, Michael, for, for, for presenting uh, the fantastic work over the many years that you've been working in the uh, the role of the stomach in, in uh, type 2 diabetes and management thereof. And uh, that allows me to move on to our next speaker for this session today, Professor Gary Whittet. Uh, Gary is a professor of medicine and the director of the Freemason Centre for Male Health and Wellbeing at the University of Adelaide and Samri. Gary is also a senior consultant endocrinologist at the Royal Adelaide Hospital and a senior principal research fellow at Samri. Gary is also a fellow of the Australian Academy of Health and Medical Sciences, and his work in obesity and men's health has been translated into guidelines, training and public health programs. And I have to say that this is probably gets my pick of the most interesting title topic for these AB, uh, ABMC mini reviews. And that is the title of Gary's presentation today, which is Men's Health, Icons, Iconospheres and Iconoclasts. Uh, so please welcome Gary. Thank you very much, Andrew. The, um... Strange title really relates to the issue of testosterone. And I just want to begin by talking a little bit about um, the Center for Men's Health, um, which began um, with a Flory Adelaide male aging study, a cohort study, which enrolled now up to two and a half thousand men uh, in 2000, beginning in 2002, and called the Flory Adelaide male aging study. And that formed a platform, subsequently leading to the formation of the Freemason Center for Men's Health at the University of Adelaide. And then in 2020 through 2021, uh, we've now formed um, what is called the Freemason Centre for Male Health and Wellbeing, uh, for which there's a Northern Division, uh, which sits in the Northern Territory at the Menzies School of Health Research. And that's headed by um, Professor James Smith, who was one of my first PhD students in this area. And then the Southern Division, which is based here at Samri, um, which includes uh, Flinders University, University of Adelaide, and um, also partners with uh, Wardley Paringa Aboriginal Health Equity um, forms the Southern Division. Uh, we have an independent scientific advisory committee. Um, we're forming a business and industry advisory board. Uh, we're overseen by a governance committee, and then above that, um, the, the board of Masonic Charities and the uh, board of the um, center, which forms a company. We are interested, like everybody else, in research impact, uh, want new knowledge responsive to consumer and stakeholder priorities, embrace innovation, disseminate it to end users, advance health, well-being, education policy and practice. We want an enduring impact on individuals, families and communities, social and economic and environmental determinants inform the approaches that, and the problems that we solve. We want to be sure that what we do um, considers health equity uh, through intersectoral action. And uh, we want uh, interventions that will enhance um, health promotion, prevention, and early intervention. And then hopefully goes without saying, culturally responsive, train the next generation of leading researchers, professional practice and policy makers, and build capacity for research policy and practice initiatives. And this is the um, rather complicated um, set of research programs that we have in the center. Um, I'm not going to take you through all of them. It serves only as an introduction to the small uh, section that I've carved out here that I'm going to talk about, which is my work on testosterone and type 2 diabetes using clinical trials and epidemiology as the platforms um, to, to do this work. Now, an icon is a representation uh, or symbol of a belief or practice often used in, uh, in religious imagery. 
an iconosphere is much harder to get a grasp on because it comes from um, philosophical concepts. But I've got it down here as our perceived cognitive world that's informed by the representations that surround us. In other words, our belief systems, what we see and think and know to be true because they are true to us. And an iconoclast is a person who attacks cherished beliefs. Here is the uh, main subject I'm going to talk about, which is the hypothalamopituitary gonadal axis, which is the part of the physiology of our bodies that ends up producing testosterone in the testis and spermatozoa in the testis. And then testosterone is converted in the body to estradiol or dihydrotestosterone or axis testosterone itself. And there are higher centers in the hypothalamus that connect us with the environment. So the circadian rhythms, the sleep-wake cycle, food intake, nutritional and metabolic cues, and other aspects of physiology that link reproduction and nutrition. And then testosterone, actually all sex steroids, can't circulate by themselves. They bind to a protein called sex hormone binding globulin, which is made in the liver, to which they bind tightly or weakly to albumin. And then there's the, been this notion that some fraction of testosterone circulates free, and that's what should be measured because that what is what has meaning. So the first um, bit of uh, work that we did in this area was to ask the question, which measure of testosterone is most relevant? And in fact, that's why we set up the cohort in the first place, is to try and understand this. So in these nearly 2,000 men, we have measurements of testosterone, and we've plotted these measurements um, to correlate with fat mass, hemoglobin, lean mass, hematocrit, isometric grip strength, which is in the non-dominant hand, um, sexual desire, um, total and dyadic. To um, total means together with a partner and by yourself. Uh, uh, dyadic is just sexual desire for, for activity with a partner. Um, and then we've measured testosterone using different methods, so liquid chromatography, standard uh, platform radioimmunoassay, bioavailable by either calculated or direct measurement. And then we set up a bioassay, which was done by Eleanor Need in Wayne Tilly's laboratory. Uh, and then we used various calculated forms of free testosterone, either based on the radioimmunoassay or liquid chromatography. So the bottom line is that the radioimmunoassay and the liquid chromatography perform similar similarly and considerably better than any of the other me measures, although very close to the uh, bioactive testosterone. So we, we believe these approximate the truth. And the calculated free testosterone um, performs the worst, followed very closely by bioavailable. In fact, this was work done uh, initially as part of a PhD thesis, and Professor David Halsman called it the most definitive refutation of the bioavailable testosterone assay he'd ever seen. And you can see the Bland-Altman plot here. They don't agree as well as you think they might, but not too badly either. So that was one. The second is this notion of an andropause and that when you get older, your testosterone level necessarily decreases. Well, if you plot total testosterone against age, uh, there's barely a slope and there are as many points above as there are below the line. What's more closely associated with decreasing testosterone is increasing waist circumference with the largest point of inflection occurring just before you get to 100 centimeters, which is considered obese. And here's what happens over five years in relationship to age. Effectively, there's almost no change at all. What does cause a change in testosterone is it decreases if you stop smoking. Now, that's no reason to smoke um, because it kills you. And then if you have it, it doesn't matter. Staying married is very good for maintaining high testosterone levels. Becoming obese causes your testosterone level to fall. And uh, having cardiovascular disease or uh, depression, uh, which is persistent, is not good for maintaining an adequate uh, testosterone level. Now, here's what happens with um, changing weight. If you go from normal to obese, your testosterone level falls. If you go from obese to normal, your testosterone level increases. And here's some data put together by Mattis Grossman. Um, the two studies where the arrows are are studies that uh, we did here um, with uh, Joan Koo, who was a visiting research fellow from Singapore, showing that if you lost weight by diet, you got an increase in uh, serum testosterone levels. Up here is bariatric surgery. Here is a study that uh, we thought initially was uh, represented by the acid and football team, but it's not its diet and exercise and why the effects are anomalous, I'm not sure. But otherwise, they fall across the line. 
Another one of the concepts is that when you uh, become obese and your testosterone level falls, that your estrogen level goes up. And this has driven this industry of people being given aromatase inhibitors to try and improve their health or increase their testosterone level. And in fact, what we showed, this is work done by Albert Liu, who did a holiday research project with us. He was one of our medical students, that in fact, as testosterone falls, uh, your level of uh, estradiol falls, but the level of estradiol falls slower than the testosterone falls, so you get a changing ratio of testosterone to estradiol, and that's because as you increase the fat mass, you have more aromatase to convert testosterone to estradiol, but you don't get more aromatase per unit mass of fat cell. It's just the total amount is increased. So that they both decrease, but one decreases at a faster rate than the other. Another um, thing that was held to be true, and in fact, I went around the world saying that this was true and gave people advice to measure testosterone as a marker of the severity of obstructive sleep apnea. And in fact, we showed in this study written up by Bridget Clark, based on data from our cohort, uh, that in fact, it doesn't matter how you measure obstructive sleep apnea severity, whether it's apnea hypopnea index, uh, ODI, which is the oxygen desaturation index, time spent desaturated more than 90% of the arousal index model. Once you correct for obesity, you lose any significance. So it's not obstructive sleep apnea that drives lower testosterone. It's the obesity that precedes the obstructive sleep apnea and is associated with it, causally associated with it. Nonetheless, even though testosterone goes down with obesity, does it matter? And yes, the answer is it matters. And here you can see that adjusted testosterone at baseline is a factor that is causally associated with incident type 2 diabetes. So here is, uh, this is data from the Massachusetts Male Aging Study that was analyzed together with um, uh, Andre Arujo, Arujo and Varant Kapelian and John McKinley in Boston. And you can see here is that as you increase the number of components of the metabolic syndrome, as you become obese or if you combine them, then these are the factors that are associated with incident type 2 diabetes. We have very similar data from our cohort. But what is interesting is that when you look at constructing an ROC curve, the uh, best values come around 14 to 16, which is not hypogonadal, suggesting that, in fact, there's something about testosterone to modify diabetes risk that's not necessarily associated with how low it is, but whether it's reaching a particular higher level. So we set out to do this study and ask a question, will testosterone treatment prevent or reverse newly type diagnosed type 2 diabetes in men who are overweight or obese with a relatively low serum testosterone level? Now, it turns out that this is less than 14, which is not less than or equal to, which is not particularly low, but we didn't think we'd get, off with any, get away with any other cutoff round through ethics committees, let alone an NH and MRC panel. We picked men aged 50 to 74 because that's where the risk of diabetes increases most, abdominal obesity because of the risk. And we took men either with high risk based on impaired glucose tolerance on an oral glucose tolerance test, or they had newly diagnosed diabetes up to about 15 um, millimole per liter on the two hour glucose on the, on the OGTT. There were a bunch of exclusions I won't go through. We divided uh, the population, which now were 20% with diabetes and the remainder with impaired glucose tolerance into half that got a lifestyle program and injected with testosterone every um, three months for two years. And the other group that just got the lifestyle program and placebo, and they were stratified for age group, waist circumference, two hour glucose, smoking and family history. So what did we find? Well, there was a 41% decrease in the prevalence of type two diabetes in the use of testosterone compared to placebo. And in looking at subgroup analyses, this is a two hour glucose greater than 11.1. Uh, so the primary outcome of the absolute number of people with the proportion of people with diabetes. It didn't matter whether you had diabetes at baseline or no diabetes at baseline. Uh, there were um, similar probability of an improvement. And it also didn't matter what your testosterone was at baseline or what the method of measurement was. So whether it was less than 11, greater than 11, or if you divide it into quintiles, you got much the same answer. There were advantages in terms of body composition. So although no major difference in body weight, waist circumference much decreased in the testosterone group, increase in muscle mass, 
greater decrease in total fat mass and abdominal fat mass, increase in arm muscle mass and grip strength. And who wouldn't want better sexual function? Here's an improvement compared to the opposite effects just with the uh, lifestyle program in erectile function score, orgasmic function score, sexual desire, intercourse satisfaction, overall sex, sexual, sexual satisfaction, but no difference in low urinary tract symptoms, which was there as a safety measure. Was it safe? Well, we saw really no uh, significant differences, bearing in mind, of course, the very small numbers of events. But what we were most concerned about was ischemic heart disease, 13 in the events in the placebo group, seven in the testosterone group, cerebrovascular disease, no different, expected different for critical BPH, um, where, where hospitalization, catheterization, or a procedure had to take place, no difference in prostate cancer, um, I don't think you can really call the depression. Two venous thrombotic events, which goes with uh, what's known about testosterone. And we really don't know what the significance of the cancers are because there were just only one or two cancers of each type, two deaths in each group. And uh, the individuals who participated in these studies uh, across the uh, different centers, Fiona Stanley Hospital, Professor Yap, Bronwyn Stuckey at the Keogh, David Jesse Darson who helped me here in Adelaide, Warwick Inder in Brisbane, uh, Anne Conway and David Hanelsman, Concord, and um, Mattis Grossman and uh, Mark Ng Tang Fui uh, at the Austin Hospital. Uh, a fantastic job of work for a very difficult study and acknowledgements to the many people who helped with the other work and were pivotal in its accomplishment. Thank you for your attention. Thanks so much, Gary. That was a brilliant presentation. Um, fascinating. Uh, testosterone. I, I, I must admit, um, it, it, it strikes me as being an incredibly powerful uh, factor on, on, on the uh, reduction of type 2 diabetes with a 41% decrease. My, my question f f to you is, is more about uh, around how, how is it administered and what is the stability of the administered testosterone? Can you give a sense of that? Yeah, I mean, testosterone is a very stable molecule. So, um, you know, even if you just store it in the fridge, it's quite stable for a prolonged period of time. And that's true for many steroid molecules. Um, it's administered uh, because it's a long acting depot form of testosterone. Uh, the molecule, undecanoic molecule, is more stable, um, it has to be cleaved to be active. Uh, and then it's um, formulated in an oil. Um, which allows it to sit within a depot and absorb slowly from that depot. So the placebo injection is simply the oil. We give it as a, as a bolus, so we repeat that six weeks later, so it forms a loading dose. And then another six weeks later, they then get the next dose, and then every three months thereafter. So that gives pretty stable levels. Um, we only measured trough levels in the study, but they were acceptable trough levels within known pharmacokinetic parameters. Clearly, there's a marked pharmacodynamic effect, which is more than physiological, because there was marked suppression of FSH and LH, um, and marked suppression of, uh, well, not marked suppression, but significant suppression of SHBG. Uh, in terms of general well-being for the individuals involved in the trial, I mean, did you look at PROMS uh, assessments and, and the like? Yeah, I mean, there's an enormous amount of data, obviously, I haven't shown. Um, sure. just in the interest of time. But we did do comprehensive psychosocial assessments and um, yep. also quality of life assessments. So physical quality of life um, gets a p-value of like 0.06. It doesn't quite make it. But nothing yep. else comes even remotely clear, uh, close to, to significant. So, um, you know, and what I don't know yet, because we haven't really looked, is whether those people who got the best improvement in sexual function uh, were the ones who were reflecting on uh, the greatest quality of life. When we looked at the end of the yep. study and we asked people what they thought they were taking, it's about one third either way. So one third on placebo thought that they were on testosterone, one third on testosterone thought, you know, and yep. so it went. Um, yep. So, it, you know, it really just depends, I think, on what kind of um, benefit they got, but we don't know what determines those other benefits, apart from body composition and the blood sugar, which seems to be a constant. Thank you so much for that, Gary. I have just one final question before we wrap up for this afternoon, and that relates to the things, in your view, if you were to sort of, you know, obviously without providing names, which, which men would, would benefit mostly from, from testosterone? Well, you know, if you ask this question to um, several of us involved in the study, you'll get a different answer from each one, because there are some people who take the view that this is a game changer and um, it's very hard to get weight and keep weight off people. This is a very effective anti-obesity drug, if you think of it in those terms. Um, there are some safety issues that I haven't been into. 
Um, I think that it's an extremely good treatment for people who have pathological hypogonadism. And we can now say that um, improvements in, uh, in blood glucose and reversal of early uh, diabetes is um, a benefit that can also be obtained. Whether any other men, bearing in mind that what we see here is a pharmacological effect, should get testosterone, I think would depend on longer term safety outcome data. Yeah, look, so much, Gary. Look, thank you to Michael and Gary for fascinating pre presentations this afternoon. I'm really grateful for, for, for you sharing your time of being such busy clinician researchers. Uh, so thank you very much. So I'd ask that you uh, join us next time, uh, next time, uh, Tuesday, next week, uh, same bat channel and ba same bat time. So thanks so much for your time this afternoon. Cheerio.